Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, more people, I'm sure, will join us as we go along here. I would like to say good afternoon now since it literally just turned to noon. Welcome, Kelly. Uh, so Kelly Hurley is a counselor at Cedar and Oaks. Um, just a little about her. Mu much of her experience has been working with people to heal the wounds left by neglect and trauma. Life is stressful and Kelly has a specialty training and experience to help. One of her areas of expertise is in eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR for short. I asked her to speak about this today. It's something that I have been really curious just to learn about. Um, when not helping others, Kelly enjoys the outdoors, reading a good book that is not related to counseling, finding a new way to be creative and being with her family. She's a member of her church and enjoys serving in the student ministries on the missions committee, as well as teaching a Bible study. Um, if you guys have questions during the presentation, please feel free to throw those in the Q&A or into the chat. Uh, we will both try to keep an eye on that. So if your question doesn't get answered immediately, just keep in mind, we will definitely bring that up at some point. So I am going to stop my screen sharing and I'm going to turn it over to you, Kelly. All right. Thank you so much. I really was looking forward to this opportunity to talk with all of you about this. Let me put on my glasses so I can see what I'm doing. Let's see. Oh. oh, there we go. Okay. I want to make sure I'm sharing the right one with you. And then we will turn that into a slideshow. Yay. All right. So this is me and it's July. A little bit more details about my experience specifically with EMDR. I graduated back in 2003 from Kirkland, Washington, a small college up there. Completed my DBT and CBT training in 2005, but notice that just wasn't enough. There was a lot of people, especially my clients with borderline personality disorder that had a lot of uh, trauma and things that were getting in the way of them actually taking on the skills. So I always was curious in EMDR therapy. So in 2009, I was able to complete that basic training and the 10 hours of consultation that we need in order to be completely trained in EMDR therapy. And then since then, in the, in the ensuing years, I've done a bunch of different advanced trainings. I became certified in 2018, and as well as became an approved consultant um, through MDRIA, which is the International Association here in the United States. And 2019, became a facilitator with one of the 70 to 80 different training organizations you could use to get trained in EMDR. Um, and so I, and I've enjoyed doing the facilitation uh, during the practice, the small group practice. And then in this year, I officially became a trainer in training with EMDR professional training. So when someone says EMDR therapy to you, what comes to mind? I'm just going to kind of throw that out. A lot of people have a lot of different perspectives on this. Might be a good one, might be not a good one. You may have heard some not great stories about clients that have done EMDR therapy, you may have had some really good stories of people doing EMDR therapy. Uh, so what comes to mind? Uh, uh, help for vets, yes, trauma, trauma, trauma. Absolutely, good for trauma, good for trauma. Rapid eye movement, yep. Movie-like therapy, Andrea, we will talk about that, okay? Um, yes, definitely effective for trauma. All right, PTSD. Thank you, Alicia. Evidence-based research for PTSD, like REM sleep. Yes, good. Okay, intimidating. Oh, dear. Hopefully, I can take some of that edge off. Yes. And Dr. Shapiro, yes, Francine Shapiro. We lost her about two years ago now, three years ago now. This pandemic has like turned my time frames on on edge. <laughs> All right. 
So by the end of the part uh, by the end of the presentation, we're going to kind of describe a top down versus a bottom up approach to trauma therapy, just kind of in general to see where EMDR therapy fits in this. We're going to look at some randomized control trial research projects. Early on, that was the big complaint is that EMDR was kind of woo woo therapy. So I want to talk about the research that backs this up at this point. Describe um, EMDR therapy's adaptive information processing theory. We're going to look at the eight phases of EMDR therapy, look at the three prongs that we go through. We're going to talk about maybe which clients to select to do EMDR therapy, or if you want to get trained or you are trained, who are you going to use EMDR therapy with and be able to kind of assess if somebody's ready. Okay. So let's talk brain first a little bit, just kind of overview, right? We've got the neocortex, right? Some of that frontal lobe stuff, that executive processing, getting stuff ordered. We've got the limbic system, right? That alarm system, the emotional system. Um, and then we've got that the brain stem, that stuff that feeds everything down to the body and back up to the brain, right? How are we doing, right? We got that brain gut connection, got the brain to everything else connection. So how's that working? So top-down approaches, right? So we start, start with usually some kind of cognitive insights, using some images, dreams, memories for people. This is your cognitive behavioral therapy. It's your dialectical behavior therapy. It's your CPT. It's prolonged exposure, some narrative therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, right? We're talking about sort of starting at the head and what you imagine and what your thinking is and analysis. And then we work down into your emotions and then work down into awareness of body sensations. Bottom up approaches are gonna be stuff more like your art therapy, particularly guided drawing, um, using both hands, using um, your body to get into the creative experience and, and experiencing things through your body first, using, using rhythmic repetitions, using that sensory awareness, and then going all the way up into into that cognitive integration of what you're learning. Somatic experiencing, Peter Levine's um, stuff, and maybe even some psychodrama where people get to act out um, past experiences and work through the trauma um, that they may have experienced in their childhood or young adulthood, right? So this is some of that guided drawing I was talking about, right? Using both hands, getting into some finger painting, using your, your ways to, to access what's happened to you through through your body. Which is better? Uh, top down, bottom up, what's what do we what do we like? So maybe a combination of things. My proposal is that um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy is kind of in the middle there. It uses that top down. There's some of that there and then it also uses that bottom up. We're kind of coming at this from from both sides which is the nice piece about this, okay? There's also some neurosequential model stuff with Bruce Perry, maybe some accelerated resolution therapy. We can talk about that if, if you've heard about that. So let's kind of dive into the research. I don't wanna to go too deep into this, but I do wanna propose um, some things. The EMDR Research Foundation is a great resource. If you wanna do a really deep dive, they have collected any and all things related to EMDR therapy, as well as other trauma therapies and how do these things kind of go head to head. Um, there are a lot of randomized control trials now that have been run um, taking different types of therapy and putting it head to head with EMDR and then having also control groups and that kind of thing. They've done randomized control groups with children um, with trauma. so taking a moment, taking a look, going and, and, and ex exploring this a little bit can be helpful to knowing like why, why this stuff works. Okay. Is this an evidence-based practice? Okay. 2017, the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense said absolutely. And they gave it the highest level recommendation, placed it in the category of the top three trauma-focused psychotherapies. So it's really got some good research behind it. It's got some good evidence behind it at this point. And so many organizations are, are really touting this to be one of their top um, therapies to go to, to, to work on trauma. Additionally, right, we've got the World Health Organization. Um, and then we've got 
England, we've got Australia, we've got France, we've got Germany, we've got the Dutch, who are all saying this is really, really good stuff. Okay. The one outlier, we will admit it, the American Psychological Association, 2017, their practice guidelines, they still say we do good, but they just don't say we're in the top, right? Now, again, this is from the EMDR uh, Research Foundation. They did write up a paper. Some people really looked at why the APA wasn't approving EMDR, and they said, okay, we, we think we've got a few errors in how you evaluated this. So they wrote a response paper there to it. You can check out that response paper. Some specific randomized controlled trials and what did they find? So in 2002, right, we did a head-to-head -head prolonged exposure EMDR therapy. We said they both do a really good job. There was improvements found using either method of treatment. However, participants in the EMDR condition showed greater gains at the three-month follow-up. And EM, the EMDR condition only used three hours of homework compared with 28 hours um, for prolonged exposure. Um, in 2002, right, another controlled comparison used EMDR therapy versus exposure and some cognitive restructuring in addition to a wait list, just to really compare and contrast, okay? So both EMDR and exposure therapy uh, produced significant improvements EMDR seemed to be much, it seemed to be more beneficial for depression, social functioning, and required fewer treatment sessions. Over and over again, you're going to hear the fewer treatment sessions, fewer treatment sessions. They could do it in a quicker time frame. Subsequently, they did a reevaluate. There was another study that did a reevaluation um, for uh, that for pre to post treatment IES, right? Um, they seem to have a predictor of positive outcomes. Okay. Oops. Yeah. Again, EMDR seemed to do equally well in a 2005 research study. The main, um, it, it, despite less exposure and no homework. Okay. And in 1997, um, clients were demonstrating that after three. 90 minute sessions of EMDR therapy, it eliminated PTSD. Right? They no longer met criteria in 90% of the rape victims they were doing treatment with. Some studies funded by Kaiser Permanente showed EMDR doing really well. With children, again, I said that we've got a few examples in 2008. There was some research done with kids. So there was 26 children, average age of 10 years with behavioral problems. They were randomly assigned to either receive EMDR therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. Both were found to have significant positive effects on behavior and self-esteem problems. The EMDR therapy group showed significantly larger changes in the target behaviors. Another research study in 2004, again, EMDR therapy, again, CBT produced significant reduction in the PTSD and behavior problems. EMDR was significantly more efficient using approximately half the number of sessions to achieve the results. Whoops. Lastly, we had children, Sample size of 52, 26 of the kids were put in a CBT group and the other 26 were put in an EMDR therapy group and there was an explosion at a firework factory. Both treatment approaches produced significant results, right? Treatment gains for the EMDR therapy was reached in fewer sessions, again. So let's do, what is EMDR therapy? So. The picture there is of Francine Shapiro's third edition of her textbook. It's the one we're still currently using. So we've got three main components. We've got adaptive information processing model and theory. And then we've got the eight phases of the therapy protocol. And we've got a three-pronged approach. We're gonna go into some detail about each of those. 
So what is the adaptive information processing model? Okay. The AIP model focuses on the patient's own ongoing resources. So within the AIP model, one assumes that the human brain can usually, most of the time, process stressful information. It's why not everyone develops PTSD when they go through things, right? we have That's the most interesting part of things, right? We have people all go through a tornado incident and everybody in the neighborhood, some people develop PTSD, some people don't develop PTSD. Why? Right? This is what we're kind of trying to look at or at least treat so that they don't have to have um, PTSD forever. So if this innate information processing system gets impaired, the memory is going to be stored in a raw, unprocessed, and maladaptive form, right? We're going to have weird beliefs about ourselves. We're going to have irrational beliefs about ourselves. And a particularly distressing incident may then become stored in a really state-specific form. We've all seen clients, when we even kind of briefly touch on a memory, they just almost act like they just flashed back into the past and started um, from that place where this, this event happened and this memory happened. So this implies there's also an inability to connect with other memory networks, right? So if I flash into the past and it just activates like it's happening right now, right? I'm not pulling on adaptive information I could be. So Francine hypothesized that when a memory is encoded in such an excitatory state-specific form, the original perceptions can be triggered by a variety of internal, so we've got internal stuff going on, body sensations, thoughts going on in the head, emotional feelings, right? And external stimuli. I just caught a guy out of the corner of my head in a cowboy boot and, and red shirt, uh, guy gotta get out of here, right? So what's coming up, or I smell a smell, right? We just had the 4th of July fireworks going off. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I, I got to get out of town and be somewhere where there are no fireworks because I know what happens to me when I can, when I smell that smell and hear those sounds, right? So in view of the AIP model, so dysfunctionally stored memories form the basis for future maladaptive responses. That's where we get those big responses, even 10, 12 years after an event has happened because the perceptions of the current situations are automatically linked with associated memory networks of these unprocessed, dysfunctionally stored memories. Whoops. Yep, there we go. So we've got disturbing events can be stored in the brain in an isolated memory network, right? So I've got my little neuron and it's got the disturbing memory. And then over here in my other little memory neuron, right, I've got adaptive information and those two things just can't get together. The old material just keeps getting triggered over and over again. And the clients will say things like, I just feel stuck. Feels like I'm locked up and just in a loop, right? So the information you need to resolve that disturbing event, right, it's over there and it's way over there in the a totally other memory network, and the new information is prevented from linking up, right? I'm feeling imprisoned. Okay. However, now when we do the EMDR, those eye movements and that reprocessing, those appropriate connections start getting made. We can link up that adaptive information. Maybe even other disturbing material from the past can emerge unexpectedly. So I've done a processing session where I thought we were only going to be working on one memory, and we had four others join the party. Hello, I want to be reprocessed too. This sounds great. And so they've literally been able to reprocess four fairly significant things that happened in a one, two, three session. I mean, sometimes it takes a little while, but they reprocess all of them out. Instead of having to do one, each one of them individually, we can kind of generalize this information because of how it's stored in the brain and in the body. So we can link up all kinds of adaptive information to many different memories, and then the re resolution can take place. So we use the metaphor. This is going to be like a reservoir draining out of our bodies. The negative and disturbing information just kind of drains away with the reprocessing. Body sensations relax. I love it as I'm doing eye movements, and I can just see my clients kind of sink back into my sofa. 
and they just take a deep breath and it just starts melting in a way. Okay, the stress drains away, the emotions process, right? The emotional charge starts going down, thoughts neutralize at least, they at least neutralize, if not turn positive. And I don't have to suggest any of it. It's their brain doing the healing. That's the amazing piece. So no matter how disturbing the emotions or the images or thoughts that are coming up, we know that it's unlocking and it's just draining away. Nothing negative is being put in. It's all being let out. Now, negative stuff might be coming up and that can kind of feel overwhelming. Oh my gosh, this other memory is coming. This other memory is coming. I'm like, that's okay. Just let it come. Let it come. I'm here with you. We can work on this. Just let it come and let it go away, right? We're just noticing it and we're letting it pass through. Unpleasant ses uh, sensations that may arise during the treatment are simply a sign that the old material is starting to, again, drain away and leave the brain, right? So we've lit up that neocortex and all that good information about ourselves. We're getting in the limbic system and that alarm system that's going off, our little amygdala in the middle there. We're just putting all the pieces of the brain together. And then the brain stem is giving us information about how the body feels about remembering all of this. Where is the stored in the body? Okay. So eight phases. Let's talk about our eight phases here. You're going to do your typical standard assessment that you always do, whether you work for a community mental health agency, hospital system, um, you're in your own private practice, right? You're going to do whatever history, you're going to do whatever assessment you normally do. And within that assessment, you're going to take some history on the trauma, right? And you're going to do some other sessions and additional sessions to continue taking some history about what's going on to continue the assessment with this client and to start setting up a treatment plan for EMDR therapy. You'll still do a typical treatment plan meeting all the Arizona code requirements, right? But there is a treatment plan within um, EMDR therapy that takes a look at these eight phases and the three prongs we're going to talk about in a moment and look at how we want to set up which memories we're going to start working on first. Two, we're doing preparations. We're going to do some education. What's EMDR? What's EMDR therapy? How does this work? Keeping it a little bit simple. We don't want to over explain things. We also want to do some resourcing, right? I want to make sure they are whatever they already have and do in any internal or external resources. I want to make sure they've got those. And if they need any additional ones in order to be able to do this therapy, we need to spend some time. I might spend one session doing that. I might spend eight or 10 sessions doing some of this stuff, getting them ready. Number three, right? We've got assessment or this is an activation quickest phase we've got. We just get them through that activation phase so that we can get them into desensitizing the material. In phase three, we picked one memory to work on. We, we call that our target memory, and then we're going to desensitize. We're going to let that drain out. Once that's drained out, we do an installation phase. We want to really make sure that when you think about that memory, because we haven't gotten rid of that memory, that we can take a positive belief about ourselves and really put it with us. What's the best, strongest, positive belief I need with that old memory? And we do some more installation, fast sets of BLS to really help that to, to test. We're testing. Can I really have a, a really strong belief about myself, even with that old, not great material? Or does something else come up? And I've, I've gone into phase five and we started doing the processing and we thought we were all done with the reprocessing in phase four, but we weren't. And so we kept doing some more work and we kept installing. What else do we need in order to be able to install the positive, right? Or to strengthen, we call it kind of strengthening that positive stuff. Number six, the body scan. This is our last great phase of what people traditionally call the, the EMDR. They don't realize we're doing EMDR when we're in phase one and two, maybe not even in phase three, um, but phase four, five, and six are when we do bilateral stimulation. So we're doing BLS or the old textbook said DAS, which was dual attention stimulation. So either way, BLS, DAS, doesn't matter. We're doing the eye movements again to, to still just reprocess what do we need to flush out of the system. And the body keeps the score. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's book, right? 
probably all read it. If you haven't, definitely recommend it. But the body keeps the score. The last thing I do is double check with the body. When you think about that old stuff and you scan slowly and mindfully your whole body, what are you noticing? And seeing if anything else is still tucked away in there. Um, that the body still needs to, to release and let go of. Number seven, I'm doing closure every session. Sometimes I'll do phase four and go to phase seven. So this is not a linear type of therapy. Sometimes I've been in phase four, I had to go back to phase two. We need a little bit more resourcing. We need to do a little bit more preparation for this new target memory we're working on. We're kind of back and forth and in and out of some of these phases. Okay, but every session I'm going to wrap it up and do some closure or just double check, do a little bit of talking with the client, make sure they're stabilized, make sure they're ready to go back out into their life. Right. What do you have going on this week? See how oriented they are to time and space. Make sure they're really back in their body, back all the way in this present moment. They're not still stuck in that past stuff. Right. And then phase eight, I'm doing reevaluation typically at the beginning of each session. What am I reevaluating? What processing happened between last session and this session, right? EMDR therapy, the processing kind of keeps going on. Sometimes you get a lot of ab reaction maybe in between, which is again, why do phase two? Resourcing, what are the things you're gonna do if you get an ab reaction to take care of yourself, right? So making sure that how is that one target memory going and how are we doing just on the reason you came in? What, are the, what about the symptoms? What PTSD symptoms were you experiencing? Are your nightmares getting better? Um, are you getting out in the community more? You're not isolating as much, not feeling as depressed, right? You're getting a little bit more active. Your family's noticing your countenance is lightening up, right? You're, you're doing really good. So, right, so we're working through our eight phases. Here's another way to look at this. So EMDR therapy in a nutshell. Right, we're identifying the issues. What's the presenting issue your client's coming in with? I may not have a client come in and say, I have PTSD, right? So they come in and they say, I've got a lot of anxiety. I've got a lot of depression. I, I know I have childhood trauma, right? I've been watching all those TikTok videos and I know, I know I've got a ton of trauma that needs to be worked on. They don't know if they're ready for it yet. They don't know what that means, but right, they, they want help with this, right? They're having relationship difficulties. I've dated this different guys, but it feels like by the end of it, when we break up, I've been dating the same man over and over and over again. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep pick picking the same person? Men will tell me like, why am I picking the same woman over and over again? It feels like I'm always picking my mom, right? What, what's going on that people are getting in the same relationship over and over again? Why does it feel like the real, it's going to be completely different in the beginning. And then all of a sudden you find yourself two years, three years down the road. And you're like, yep, same person, same problems. How, how is this? What, what is going on? So really getting clear on what the issues are that we're going to be tracking and how the here and now issues, the present day issues, are those changing? So is EMDR working to make changes on those presenting concerns? Okay. Developing that treatment plan, figuring out all the things that we're going to work on in the past to get those clear out, figuring out what present triggers, right? Those smells, the things that we see, maybe triggers we don't know about, we're noticing differences. Okay. I had a client that I was working with, this is my, one of my very first EMDR therapy clients. And she was so amazing. She was so brave to like let me do this with her. And she was losing access, her health insurance. And she's like, I, I'm losing the health insurance at the end of the month. And I said, well, then let's do two hour sessions for the next three weeks. And we'll see how much of this stuff we can get cleared out. And she's like, really, you can do that for me? I said, absolutely. Let's try it. Because her ex-boyfriend who was in another state and in prison for their relationship was getting released soon. So we targeted that. She was, she had so many fears about this. She was very, very scared. So we started targeting the abuse that she went through being in a relationship with him. Some of it, I think, even link, linked to a little bit of childhood abuse, but we really kind of kept it around that relationship. And she came into me after the I don't know, first or the second session, definitely um, the second session that we reprocessed 
it might have been the third. That's what I was trying to remember. The second session of the third session, when we were doing that reevaluation and checking in about what was changing, and she said, oh my gosh, you're never going to believe what happened. And I said, what? What happened? She said, I was in a department store. My boyfriend, her current boyfriend, who was a really great guy, really supportive. She did manage to get a different relationship. Um, she said, I, he, he came, he was off in a different part of the store shopping for what he needed. And he came flying over into the women's clothing department. Are you okay? And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm fine. And she said, but the music on the overhead, she says, what, like, are, are you okay? And so she, then she listened for a little bit and she tuned into the song that was playing. And she was like, oh my gosh, she said she started laughing. And she's like, I didn't even notice the song and it's not giving me any kind of reaction or response. It was a, a song in the past that it was super triggering back into trauma, right? It was one of those external cues to her body that something bad was going to happen. And so he was afraid. And she said, she said in the past, he would have had to dig for me in those round clothing racks because I would have crawled under one of those and I would have been hiding and shaking. And she's like, and I wasn't. She's like, this stuff is amazing. So again, it can clear out some of that stuff that quickly. Some stuff doesn't go as quickly as that, but it's pretty amazing in what it can do and helping to disconnect some things, let that stuff drain away and link up other good information, right? The prep work again, right? We're connecting people to their inner resources, what that already is. We're making ourselves aware of what their inner resources are. We're not assuming they don't have any, right? They probably already have some. A lot of my clients that come see me, they've been doing therapy for several years and other therapists have done really good stabilization work with them, help them really know how to do paced breathing, other ways of regulating themselves, right? But it's not taking away the trauma. They still need something to take away the actual trauma. So we're in the assessment phase, identifying the triggers and the events, we're identifying the associated emotions, body sensations, figuring out what belief do I want to believe about myself when this is all done. In phase four there, the navy blue little acorn, we're doing that bilateral stimulation. We're doing BLS, we're doing the eye movements, right? And eye movements act, what's the theory behind the eye? Why do the eye movements work, right? We're talking about REM sleep, right? That's the best, one of the best metaphors we use for that is the REM sleep. So what happens when we're in REM sleep? The, the hypothesis, again, we don't have any actual data or research of what happens when we're in REM sleep, but if we can get to that deepest fourth wave deep sleep, that seems to be where we process our day. But if I've had trauma, I'm not sleeping well, I'm doing light sleep in and out of sleep, and I'm not getting all the way into that deep REM sleep, where I do that rapid eye movement naturally on myself, I'm not processing out my day. I'm holding on to stuff. It's like, it's tightening up everything. I'm on hyper alert. My little amygdala is just going off all the time. Stay alert, stay alert, hyper vigilance, right? We get that going on. So we think that the eye movement reprocessing that bilateral stimulation and this is the thing that's been researched the most is doing the eye movements, keeping your eyes open and doing the eye movements. If you haven't seen it, I wonder if I can I can throw it up in the link in here. If you haven't seen the, the video with Andrew Huberman, I'm going to forget the title of the video. Do I have it on my post-it notes behind here? Um, it is. Oh, I'm not going to find it really quick. So he did a video on why eye movements work. He does a lot of biological um, research with mice as well as humans. And he was looking at the eye movements and he said, people keep coming to me due to my research and saying like, so do you think this is why EMDR therapy works? And so then he took a look at EMDR therapy and he said, oh yeah, he said, this is totally why this works because when we're in a stress response and running away from things, our eyes naturally go back and forth to get away from things. But if you froze, if you went into your collapse system, 
right? You didn't get a chance to do those eye movements and run away from whatever the situation was. So giving clients a chance to do those eye movements and get away from it, even if it feels like in your imagination, you finally get to get away from this and your body has that sensation, that also helps, okay? And, and the theory of why we think this works. A third theory, second theory of why this works is um, working memory. So we think, just like if I ask you to pat your head and rub your tummy, right? Pat your head, rub your tummy at the same time. It's hard. And then if I ask you to do a third thing, <laughs> hey, by the way, let's sing row, row, row your boats, right? Now I'm like really trying, okay, am I patting my head? Am I rubbing my tummy? Row, 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 like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose all three of them or do, you know, do some multiplication tables while you're trying to remember to pat your head and rub your tummy. So again, I'm having you remember something disturbing and then I'm giving you something else to do while you're remembering something disturbing. Seems to help the body be able to stay with the memory um, and, and be a little bit distracted at the same time. So you can stay present and not get lost in the past. Okay. And you get a chance to, to react to new insights, new associations, um, and that continues until the disturbing emotions are reduced. We bring the subjective units of disturbance all the way down to a zero. Okay. And so Kelly, it, we do have a couple of questions in there. Yeah, um, if awesome. you want to look them over, I can oh, read them if you can see them. Yep. No, I can What about blind? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Visually impaired. So that happened early on. Somebody got trained um, in bilateral stimulation. And so um, I can't tell. Debbie, can they see me? Because all I can see is your photo on my side. Just curious. Yes, they can. So they can see you and then the presentation. Awesome. Okay. So you can use a blush brush or something to lightly tap the back of their hands. So you can have them put their hands on their knees and you could take a blush brush and just tap the back of the person's hands to do the bilateral stimulation back and forth, back and forth. Okay. And that can go as slow or as fast as you want. That's what somebody had to do. She didn't have a blush brush in her office, but she just tapped back and forth on their knees. If you don't want to touch somebody's knees, you can have them put their hands on their knees and touch the back of their hands whatever you're comfortable with and whatever your client obviously is comfortable. Get permission to touch anybody before you touch them. Um, but yes, yes, that, and it works very well. I've, I've known several people who have worked with people that are visually impaired uh, to be able to do that. And yes, it works. Um, yes. And yes, there are buzzy. So thank you, Heather, for throwing that out. I, I use a light bar. So they have both the eye movements as well as little vibrators in their hands that go back and forth and they're synced up. So I actually give them two forms of bilateral stimulation when I'm doing this, if they can tolerate it. Sometimes I have to choose just one or the other. There's not as much research on just using buzzies or pulsers. And the tendency with the bulls, buzzies and pulsers is your clients will close their eyes and then they get way overstimulated. So um, sometimes we have to um, kind of encourage them to do this with their eyes open. Um, I've had clients tell me like, oh, I'm starting to get really nauseous. Well, is that from remembering difficult stuff or is that really the eye movements? Sometimes I have to have clients take their glasses off. I had a client that had no peripheral vision. We still use the eye movement. And again, just the fact that they're going back and forth in sleep. Um, like somebody said, um, yeah, I think Amy, you were talking about REM sleep, blind people still do REM sleep. So just like, yeah, that case, then somebody even with no peripheral vision, I'm not ask, actually asking you to look at something. I just want your eyes to have a sense and the feedback from your, um, is it a, your optical nerves back into your brain? It just does something. Again, we're still researching a bunch of stuff. We're, we've come a long way, but we've got a ways to go on knowing what all that stuff does. Okay. Vibration panels, like, yep, all right. The name of the video, I will look up the name of the video and have Debbie, yes, An Andrew, I will type in, so his name is Andrew Huberman. Um, you can probably Google um, EMDR 
therapy and see what what pops up. I am so sorry I don't have the name of that right here. It used to be on a post-it note right behind. Oh, there it is. Your behavior won't be the same. I will type that in. Sorry. Your behavior won't be the same. It's a cute, it's a short little video. I think it's like five minutes or less. Um, but it's really helpful for you yourself to know what might be working. It's it's we're getting closer and closer to sort of understanding how these mechanisms work. So any other questions about bilateral stimulation, how to do that with various kids are great. Sometimes we put buzzies in shoes when we're working with the kids. Um, sometimes, you know, I might tap on a shoulder, you know, tap on a shoulder. You can also do again on video, we can do tapping on the little eardrums. You can use tones. Tones and I, I've used music through my light bar as well. But just even try this on yourself. Just put your fingers up on either side, kind of close to that little pad of your ear and just tap. Tap fast, tap a little bit slower. You can hear that, right? And it's going in. And again, for me, that seems like that would be part of the stress response when you're under a lot of stress, right? You're going to be looking around the best you can. You're going to be trying to listen for things. What am I noticing? What am I hearing? And those seem, I think, better ways to sort of activate the stuff and also distract you um, through your PTSD sy symptoms than the necessarily the touch and the, the buzzies back and forth. So um, good question, Cassandra. Is it true that a substance user must be clean and sober for at least six months before EMDR therapy can be utilized? No, I don't necessarily wait six months. There's definitely some things I need to do with people that are actively using substances and I have to do a really good assessment with them and what are they doing in, in order to get, are they working on their sobriety? Are they working on abstinence? Are we working on harm reduction? What are we doing? And before I can say like, okay, yeah, let's use EMDR therapy. But I also know a lot of people keep using because of their trauma, because of feeling their feelings, because of, right? And so doing some EMDR therapy, I've taken some advanced protocols and work with substance use. And so I know what to do to kind of use the EMDR therapy gently and carefully. I may not do like really, really early trauma, but there's ways to help start reducing and getting them more comfortable with their emotions and with interacting with people while they're not on substances, so, okay. And then there were two other questions in the Q&A. So oh. one is um, someone who has a TBI from childhood, and then the other one is tele, can you do it via telehealth? Yes, you can do it via telehealth. I did it for 16 months before I finally went back to my office, yay. Um, felt very good getting back into the office, but it worked very good. It, it worked really well on telehealth. Um, and with TBIs, I, you can be a little careful with it, but um, depending on where the TBI is in the brain, again, those neural receptions, like they wanna link up, our brain wants to go back to health. And so allowing it to make those connections new and reroute some information, I think it, it would work around a TBI to help you access that information. Um, you may need to go a little slower. You may need to do some restricted processing, which we won't go into here, but you can learn about that if you do want to learn about EMDR therapy or do some consultation with me. We can talk about that where you do some restricted stuff around that. Also, a big question is usually, can you do it with somebody who has pseudo seizures or actual seizure disorder? I've, I've done both. Um, it's super helpful for people who have pseudo seizures, um, but I've also uh, done a, a consult with a neurologist and said, hey, do you think it's okay? I don't use the light bar um, with that. I do use hand motions and I, I use a wand actually. Oh, my, oh, I do have my wand here. So instead of using my light bar, because obviously lights with a seizure isn't going to be great, but I use a little expanding um, wand and I have a cute little sheep finger puppet that I sometimes put on the end of it. And then I can have them follow that back and forth and do the eye movements. Okay. And that way, right again, I'm not overstimulating with lights, um, their brain, but I am still having them do that eye movement. Okay. Great questions. Thank you, guys.
<laughs> this my little sheep is so cute. Um, again, I do I, I do some stuff with kids and I could do some consulting um, about working with kids. So, yep, it's good to have little toys. Very fun. Um, let's see. All right. So, yeah, I stopped on, I think, the desensitization part. So then, yeah, strengthening the positive. So I'm going to review and check in with them. We, we, when we did that initial assessment in phase three, we figured out what positive cognition they maybe want to try to move to. Um, now I'm going to check and make sure is that still the one you want to use or, or is something else even better? Maybe there's an even stronger one that came up while we were reprocessing. So they just want to strengthen those, those new beliefs. And then again, I want to do a, a mindful, uh, just a mindful scan from the top of your head all the way to the bottom of your toes. Any other disturbance when you try to think about that memory, any other disturbance throughout the rest of your body. Um, most of the time it's a no, because um, especially if you've done really good desensitization, but a couple of times we've caught something else. One of the most interesting ones, a client of mine looked at me and he's like, I keep having that pain in my shin. It's still there. My, the pain in that shin, I mentioned it when we were doing reprocessing. I don't know why it's still there. Um, and so we ended up being able to kind of play around with it and we realized what it was. And um, we were able to then reprocess that memory in, in, separately. But then he was able to clear the body scan of the memory we started with and we started a new target one and, and start going through the phases again. Okay. Cool. Three-pronged approach. Okay. Super important. I'm going to assess with my client during the treatment plan phase, right? Are we going to work on the past experiences? I'm going to work on more recent experience or more re like triggers that happen in the environment, right? So we've got situations or triggers that currently stimulate the um, disturbance. I'm going to make sure that that all gets cleared out. Sounds don't still bug you. Um, smells don't still bug you, um, music, you know, songs don't still bug you. I had a client um, who was BPD and very dissociative, so we didn't work on the past stuff, but she was, functionally, it was really hard for her to get to work. And so the reason it was hard for her to get to work is that if any motorcycles crotch rocket, she called them. That's what her term was, like a Kawasaki motorcycle that goes by really fast and they're really loud. They've got that high-pitched sound. It's really distinct. She said, if any of those motorcycles fly past her on the freeway, she always has a panic attack. She has to pull off to the side of the road. She's no good for about 20 minutes. And so every day she's got to leave for work 25 to 30 minutes earlier than she needs to so that in case she has a panic attack, she can pull off the side of the road, let herself regulate and still get to work on time. It's like, this, uh, this just sounds terrible. That's, that's no fun. This is no good. Like, let's see if we can work on that. And so we figured out what had happened in the past. She'd been on the freeway two times, believe this or not, twice. One of those had passed her. And within five minutes, she pulled up on the accident where the person had been in an accident with a car and had died. And so two times this happens to her. So now anytime she hears that noise, her body is convinced that person is dead in a few minutes and that she's going to have to see this. So we targeted the first one. So it's the first or the worst. We targeted the earliest one, reprocessed that. It, the other one kind of processed at the same time. I don't know if she noticed it or not, but I did. She was kind of going back and forth between the two different ones. And she left. It was the, the one session. She left. She came back in. I did the reevaluation. And she's like, you're never going to believe what happened. I'm like, I'm hoping I know what happened. And I said, please tell me what happened. And she's like, I was on my way to work. And one of those motorcycles went blaring past me. And I said, yeah. And she said, and I, I didn't have a panic attack. She says, I got nothing. And he was fine. I never saw him again. He passed me and I got to work and it was great. <laughs> it's like, yay. So, right. I mean, even with clients with really extensive trauma histories and a lot of symptomology, there are ways that we can work on some things that are bothering them and getting in the way of, of their current functioning in life to make life a little bit better. We, ha we hadn't worked on any of the childhood trauma. She's one of the worst abuse cases I'd, I'd seen or heard of. Um, and so we just started doing that a little bit at a time and it 
just started making life a little bit better and a little bit better, right? And then we can do future stuff. Um, if any of you are trained in DBT or use DBT skills, right, the coping ahead handout and worksheet, right? This is the future template. It's kind of like that, right? We're going to have you imagine doing something in the future that you'd, you would never normally do, or you've done it in the past and it's gone sideways and you hate it. And you're so anxious while you're doing it. We can do future templates on that and we can do imaginal exposure to a future event, a future situation. I've got a client of mine that's, um, has some OCD and a lot of triggers and, and trauma to religious symbolism, particularly nuns. Um, we know what happened in the past, why she's triggered by that. She was fine for years. All of a sudden, she's Catholic. She was at church. Um, she saw something out of the corner of her eye, and all of a sudden, she just she couldn't walk in a church building. She couldn't see religious symbols. She couldn't pass by any kind of church. She couldn't see crosses. Um, and she's like, I feel like I'm going crazy. And she's got to work so hard to calm herself down. Again, I think she was having panic attacks um, with that kind of stuff. But we've worked. We, she's actually, she's like, I don't know why I signed up for this, but I did. A friend of hers getting married in Italy. She's Catholic. They're staying for three weeks. Boyfriend really wants to go. Yep, you guessed it, to the Vatican. And so I pulled up on my laptop pictures of the Vatican. And particularly, I asked for pictures of the Vatican with nuns. And before I turned my computer around, I said, do I have your permission to show you the pictures? This is what you're going to see when I turn this around. I looked for pictures of the Vatican. I also looked for nuns in the pictures of the Vatican. And I said, can I show this to you just to see what kind of response? We've already done a lot of EMDR, a lot of work on this. And I said, let's just see what your response is to a photo. So I turned it around. I showed her the photo. And she's like, I could see her kind of, she responded. And she's like, okay. And she's like, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I said, okay. And so part of this is just the anticipation of it or the getting surprised by it. And so all of our future stuff was like, Having her imagine going for the tour of the Vatican she had set up and imagine her getting in line and, you know, and then catching nuns out of the corner of her eye and then walking back out into St. Peter's Square and seeing nuns in various places and, you know, going to the restaurant. She's like, I'll, I'll escape all that. And I'll go to the restaurant. I'm like, yeah, but there's a nun there. Like, what you know, so again, right, just sort of challenging her belief that I can't handle this. I can't tolerate it. I'm going to have a panic attack. And we were able to do some really good work um, on being able to deal with what, that vacation. Um, and she was pleasantly surprised. She's like, yeah, she goes, no, I can imagine this. She's like, I really, and I said, you might have a panic attack and you might not. And could either one be okay? You know, you know how long your panic attacks last, 15 to 20 minutes. It's going to be bad for a little bit. And then you're going to calm down and then Right. You're either going to need to take a break, go back to the hotel, drink some water, or, you know, maybe you're maybe be able to continue on with whatever you're doing. Like maybe she's like, just notice either way, notice doing either one. And she was able to do it. It was pretty, it was pretty amazing. So a lot of hope that she's going to still have a great vacation. Okay. Now, a lot of people get nervous. Like, what if I have a whole a client with a whole lot of complicated uh, symptoms? Right. So flooding ahead right? Depersonalization, derealization, dissociation, DID. My client actually meets criteria for DID, that hyper arousal, hypo arousal, right? I, they just go into collapse. Like, I don't know if you've ever gotten a client who just suddenly does the thousand yard stare. They're just not in your office anymore. And you're like, wait, where, where'd you go? Where are you? Come on back, right? Strong ab reactions. Did supervision with somebody one time. She came in for supervision. She's like, my client was like, she dove underneath my desk and ducked her head. And she's like, I don't know what, I didn't know what to do. And I said, well, what did you do? And she's like, well, I just, I sat on the floor and I just started talking to her and I asked her to look at me and, and I said, sounds good to me. Did a good job. We just, we do what we normally would do if clients dissociate in our rooms for any reason, let, a, let alone what we're doing for trauma therapy. Okay. So, but there are definitely some tricks and tips for helping clients manage those symptoms while they're doing the trauma reprocessing or things that you can do in preparation so that you may not get this as much. So the, those are some of the advanced trainings I've taken. Yeah. Um, yep, with kids. 
kids' brains process fast. Do you think EMDR goes great with adults? Like kids' neuroplasticity, man, they'll reprocess stuff like great. Okay. Um, the third edition of Dr. Robbie Adler Tapia and Carolyn Settle's book has come out. Yay. They've got some really great updated stuff in there. Um, super powerful. They still have a second edition, their treatment manual. That's good. Um, and then um, Anna, Anna, sorry, Anna Gomez. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to share an office space with her for a while. Um, she was almost never there because she was always doing trainings. But she and her husband, Jim, have a great training organization. Um, she does amazing work with kids and amazing work teaching people how to work um, with trauma. So we're really fortunate to have all three of these very talented women here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so anytime you can do some training and learn from them, it's pretty incredible um, what they've got um, going on. So the therapist result, the, the therapist role really is just attuning themselves, whether it's an adult or a child, right? But specifically with kids, helping the kids feel attuned to them, um, that that the kiddo has physical and emotional presentation needs, right? That, that the therapist is clicking into, right? The foundation again for the treatment is always preparing the client and the parents in some case if they're if the kid kiddo is really young, right? Um, special emphasis, right, is on assessing the age. What's the developmental level? Like, do they really have cognitive? For, for some kiddos, I don't do a negative cognition, right? We're not going to do a negative positive cognition. They're under six. They don't do that yet, right? So developmental stage is really important for knowing, like, what am I doing, right? Now, maybe I do a positive belief about themselves at the end, but I'm not worried about negative positive cognitions when I first am doing the work with them. Um, understanding the context of the child or teen's life experience, right? It's not what the parents brought the kid into working on. May not actually be what's bugging them the most. So really making sure you're assessing the from the child's perspective. There's one video that Dr. Robbie used to share in her trainings all the time, and they the parents, the foster parents brought the kid in because the, the father had tried to kill himself and the child by running a truck into a pole. Fortunately, she had not passed away and she was, she landed in a really great foster family. But so the foster parents came in like, you've got to reprocess this whole disturbing event with, you know, her dad in the truck and all this stuff. And Dr. Robbie said, okay, great. Thanks. Thanks so much. And then, you know, you go wait in my waiting room. And so she talked to the kiddo and said, hey, hey, what's, what's really bugging you? And she's like, this girl at school keeps stealing my chips. She steals my chips. It's like, okay, let's process that. <laughs> so they processed out this girl stealing her chips and what does she want to do instead and um, use some, some of that bilateral stimulation on her and she, that worked really good. And so then they just kind of kept working through things that were causing the child anxiety, causing the child stress. Um, and started working through those events. Um, and so it's, it, she's a great case. She was a great case. She's doing really good now. Early on, there was a lot of wondering whether or not young, young kids could do the eye movement piece, right? There, there was some speculation that children under the age of eight, their eyes don't cross the midline. And so then Dr. Robbie shows a video of a kiddo that's 18 months old and the head is perfectly straight and the eyes are crossing the midline back of it. She's got a, a hand puppet and the kiddo's going over here and going over here and going over here. The eyes were crossing the midline just fine. Um, so yes, kids can do the eye movements. Again, using toys and fun stuff and play. Sand tray therapy, there's a way that we've worked in a lot of the play therapy stuff with EMDR therapy so that it's really appropriate for kids. Mark Nickerson has wrote, written an amazing book. He just did a second edition uh, during the pandemic and updated um, some stuff, some really cool innovative strategies and protocols uh, for people with generational trauma, cultural trauma, religious, spiritual trauma, um, weaving in Native American, the tribes, um, also veterans, military, first responders, they all have a culture in and of themselves. Um, and so ways to work with, use EMDR therapy, but take care of that trauma specifically. Um, does it work with schizophrenia? 
Dr. Paul Miller out of Ireland says it does. He's been doing it for over a decade now, maybe even two decades. I can't remember when he originally got trained. Might have been, might have been in the late 90s. Um, but he's a psychiatrist, started out as a medical doctor. So he very much started out with a biological view of schizophrenia. So all we can do really is medication with them. Uh, but then he found EMDR therapy. He started working with and getting some mentoring with Colin Ross and realized maybe there's an actual basis for not just a biological view, but a trauma model for schizophrenia. The research is showing that if a person has three traumas before they're 18 years old, the risk of having a pathological level of psychosis is increased 18 times. Now add two more traumas to that. So five traumas before you're 18 years old, you're 193 times more likely to have some kind of psychos psychotic break, some kind of schizophrenic symptoms. So you tell me, right? So he's got some particular um, tips and tricks for working and using and applying EMDR therapy to those with symptoms of schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, and he, again, like I said, he's been doing this for years. Um, and I just love reading his work. He's I, he's on a podcast I just recently listened to. So listening to his Irish accent was just really fun. Um, he just seems like a lovely human being. And the stories he's got in his book are just very lyrical Irish stories. So anyway. <laughs> um, how do you know if someone is ready for, let's just say, trauma therapy, whether or not it's EMDR therapy? Um, from an EMDR therapy perspective, though, who isn't ready, you know, it's somebody with a personality disorder or somebody who's really suicidal or somebody who's currently in a domestic violence relationship. I mean, yeah, we need to you need to assess, you know, what's what's going on? How how active is the suicidality? right? What are the behaviors that are coming out with the personality disorder that might get in the way of the therapy? If they're in a domestic violence relationship, it's currently going on. They're, they aren't safe in their current living situation. This is where I'm looking at, are they really ready to do this work? Because, um, you know, if I'm constantly getting re-triggered and re-traumatized, this, this could be very difficult to do this. So what do I do to help them? I'm now I'm in phase two of EMDR therapy where I'm resourcing them, prepping them, helping them stabilize to be able to be ready to do this. I've done EMDR therapy with clients who have a history of suicidality, maybe who even have some ongoing suicidal thinking. I come from a perspective that the suicidal thinking it's a problem, but it's not the problem. There's actually something else going on that's now leading me that my only solution, I really see the suicidal thinking as the solution to some other problem. So what do I need to do? Oh, I'll get back to the skin tone question. Um, so what do I need to do to uh, address or stabilize some of the suicidality, but how can I maybe do some EMDR therapy with whatever's triggering them in their environment that has them want, that seems like life is hopeless and this is my only option. And that's worked really well doing the EMDR therapy. I reassess the suicidality and it's gone. It's, it's not there. They're not thinking about it. Okay. Yes, the slides will be posted. I know Debbie said, I've, I've sent her stuff and she's got them. So absolutely, we'll get the slides out to you guys. Um, so that, sorry, I'll go back to the slide. Whoops, with skin tone on it. It was the kid one, right? So what do we mean by skin tone? Dr. Robbie has actually seen times where as she's doing reprocessing, um, the, the person will go white right? They'll just like drain of all color or they'll get beet red, right? And something will happen. She even told the story. She was, it was, this happened to be an adult client actually, but they were reprocessing a memory, but it was just getting stuck over and over. And so Dr. Robbie said, please go back and ask your mom, like what your birth was like, what, when she gave birth to you, what was that like? He came back in the next session and he says, oh my gosh, he goes, I never knew this. He said, but I was actually, I was actually taken out of the birth canal. This was back when they used forceps. So they had gone in and grabbed him by his head and pulled him out of the birth canal. 
Um, and so when she had been doing reprocessing with him, all of a sudden this, this scooped thing on his forehead just got really red and just got really pronounced. And she got so nervous about it. She said, could you please stand up and come over to this mirror? She goes, I just want to be not like, I didn't touch you, but I want you to notice what your forehead looks like. And he's like, oh my gosh, what is that? And that's what prompted her to say, like, can you ask your mom what, what your birth was like? And he's like, they were used forceps on me. Yes, it was he, his body had gone through a physical trauma at birth. And so looking for sort of those kinds of things, those kinds of changes uh, might happen and le give you a clue as to what might have happened to the person. You may never know. You and the client may never know. And it process out over time that that mark went away and she she and he never saw that mark again. And they think the body did reprocess out that trauma. So. All right. How else to know if somebody's ready? Um, if they're not quote unquote ready to really dive into phase four through six, right? I may do lots more phase two type things, teaching them paced breathing, using all the distress, the distress tolerance skills out of the DBT skills modules, right? Breathe all kinds of good breathing exercises, mindfulness, get them into a regular exercise routine. Are they walking regularly? Are they riding a bicycle regularly? Anything I can get people to do that is bilateral stimulation for the body normally, right? Can you be on a row machine? Can you do a stair climber? Um, you know, can you go hiking regularly? Can you do some good yoga? I've had great results with clients who already have a yoga practice come in and do EMDR therapy. Their body is just like primed and ready to release stuff um, and really um, helpful. And if, if I get stuck with the body, I will sometimes encourage clients to at least do breathing practices with yoga and mindfulness um, and those kinds of things to help augment them being able to then do the EMDR therapy when they're in the room with me, but you need to practice and loosen up your body in between sessions and keep it limber for being able to do this. Uh, and you don't have to do like really hot yoga or beat up, beat up on yourself yoga. You can do yoga nedra, right? Which is helping you go to sleep. <laughs> so whatever kind of yoga, there's different, there's definitely different kinds out there to have the, the client get curious about that and explore some of those things, okay? I'm also assessing, right? What external resources do the clients have? What internal resources do the clients have? Do they have supportive friends? Do they have a supportive religious or Dungeons and Dragons group? I don't care. Um, do they have supportive extended family? Maybe their actual family wasn't so hot, wasn't so great, but maybe they've got aunts, uncles, other people that have been supportive and have been really good for them. They have a good job and a good job, meaning the job is going to be understanding if she she or he calls out sick or needs to re revamp their schedule a little bit based on some of the work we're doing. Right. Um, internal resources, how much of a sense of self that internal locus of control, that external locus of control. Right. How motivated are they to do that? My friend told me to come get EMDR therapy because it worked for her. But yeah, I don't know. Okay, so right, how much do they have a sense, right? How much is there some kind of hope that this maybe could work, right? My buttons just don't want to work. Let's see, there we go. Please know EMDR therapy is an integrative therapy. You can use your internal family systems work. You can use good play therapy work. You can use good CBT stuff. I keep mentioning the dialectical behavior therapy skills modules. I use a lot of that in the prep work or when I get stuck in we're, when we're reprocessing and they don't have skills for something. We may go over some skills and then keep doing the reprocessing, right? There's a couple of myths with the MDR therapy is that there's protocols, specific protocols for everything. And that I, I, it can't just be basic EMDR therapy that won't work for everything. Like that I have to get all these advanced trainings. It's actually not true. Basic EMDR therapy really does work for pretty much everything. There's a few things that aren't EMDR that I use that weren't, weren't standard protocol uh, EMDR just a couple of little things that I use, but everything else is just sort of a way of weaving things together. So you don't have to like go get the protocol for everything. Most of the time, it's really about doing a good assessment and knowing what you're dealing with is then, and then you can take basically EMDR, ther 
basic EMDR therapy and apply it to what's going on for the patient, what's going on for your client, what symptoms are they having, what diagnoses do they have if you don't deal in diagnoses, right? What problems in life are they experiencing? And you can apply EMDR therapy to many of those things. Marilyn Luber has edited about 10 books at this point um, that are all scripted protocols for specific things. But even she sort of jokes, like the book still says, do basic EMDR therapy protocols. Just here's a better assessment tool for this. Here's a better assessment tool for that. Here's a little bit of a different language you might be using for this, but it's not that different of a language, you know, but it's just knowing how to treat an eating disorder. Like if you know how to treat that population, you know what to say, what not to say, that kind of thing, then you can apply EMDR therapy standard protocol um, to that population. Okay. In EMDR therapy, you are very much encouraged to bring who you are now to this new protocol. Bring all your knowledge, all your skills as a clinician for as many years as you've been doing this. Know that your background and your creativity is going to add so much for your clients um, as you do EMDR therapy with them, okay? You don't have to throw out all that stuff and only do basic protocol EMDR. Now, it's good as you're practicing it to do that, to, to get used to that and to, to understand what is EMDR therapy basic protocol and then start adding in the all the amazing good stuff you already know, okay? So I just want to give you a flavor of the books really quick. So this is all the Marilyn Luber edited books. These are all the specific protocols. Again, she's got like a good 10 of them. Right, one for eating disorders, chronic pain, um, attachment issues, right, somatic medical traumas, trauma related so protocol for multiple sclerosis. Again, there's not protocols for this. It's just if you have a client that has multiple sclerosis, what do you need to know about that? What do you need to be assessed? What do you need to, and then have, then we do basic EMDR therapy, right? Pregnancy, yes, you can do EMDR therapy with women who are pregnant. There's some cautions with it, but you can do it. There's a lot more research and a lot more people doing it and using it. First responders, emergency response type of people, clinician self-care, right? We need to use a little bit of EMDR for ourselves and take care of ourselves. Some really good podcasts that are out there on EMDR, Andrea, um, they've got some good stuff. That was the one, that was where I listened to Paul, Dr. Paul Miller on the schizophrenia stuff. Let's talk EMDR, the Andrea podcast. That's the one I use for that one. Um, EMDR chat with uh, Dr. Kurt Roundson and Dr. Michelle Gottlieb. Uh, they're great. It's a it's EMDR professional training. It's it's one of the training organizations that I contract with and, and do some work with. But they've got a great podcast. They're putting out some really great material. And then what's happening? Um, so EMDR HAP. HAP stands for the Humanitarian Assistance Program. That was the training organization that I originally trained with because I was working in a community mental health training organization. That was probably the second uh, training organization that was ever created. Again, at the beginning, I said there's like 70 or 80 different training organizations at this point. EMDR HAP Trauma Recovery is one of the largest ones, and they do mostly work with um, community and mental health agencies to offer greatly reduced prices in their training. Um, so, but with them, you still have to pay for the 10 hours of consultation consultation training or after you get your training done. So it's one of the cost things to take into consideration. And then notice that is another podcast. Uh, that was one of the first podcasts I ever found. I really liked the beginning parts of the, the beginning, probably the first five to six months of the, the EMDR uh, podcast was really, really good. It was all based, it was almost like you were getting trained in EMDR, but it was really, really good. It was great refreshers. It was really good information. Um, and then they started getting into some other stuff and some other things that their business was doing. So I don't really listen to that one as much anymore, but the, again, the beginning stuff is, is really, really good on that. So those are some podcasts you can, you can tap into. I think you can find all of them on Spotify. 
So again, this is me in a nutshell. I am an Arizona approved supervisor. I'm an approved consultant with Andrea. I do DBT consultation. I've got my private practice. Um, so if you want to work on your certification in EMDR, happy to help with that. If you want to become an approved consultant yourself, we can talk about that. Um, and then just wanted to answer questions. Oh, one other, if you're not trained in EMDR, I will do a, do a slight plug. With EMDR professional training, uh, Candace um, Leninger and I are going to do a hybrid format. So we're going to do two of the weekends um, virtually, and then one of the weekends we're going to do live. So you get a chance to practice both um, in telehealth as well as face-to-face -face, uh, with a client. Um, and we're going to do that here in Phoenix um, So in 2024. So it's going to start in January. So love to have you come join us. And then, yes, I will offer questions. What can I? Awesome. I had one weird question. So the smell. So if you're talking about a smell, do you have to know what the smell is? Not necessarily. Okay. They can just make a face and just go, oh, whatever that is. And I just noticed that. Okay. Process out whatever that smell was. If that, like, I can't really describe whatever that was. Okay. Just notice it. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I don't know what it is. If I did know, I would avoid it, but I don't know what it is. So exactly. super well, cool. Well, that well, is seriously fascinating. Does anybody else have any other um any other questions about anything? I'm sharing a little screen now. Um, if you want to go on and give us a positive review, if you have a second, that would be awesome. Um, otherwise, when I send out the, I'll be sending out your certificates, the slides, and then um, I will also send out a QR code for Cedar and Oaks, which is Kelly's practice. Um, we always, you know, all of us who work in this industry, in any industry, positive reviews make the world run. Um, and I think this presentation was incredible. I absolutely loved all the information. I wrote down all kinds of stuff and then remembered I have the slides, but <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone. That was incredible. Um, I don't see any other questions there. I have the two part training, but need consultation. Do I have to start over if it's been two years? That Gail, I would send you back to your training organization to double check. Um, training institute versus some of that stuff has changed. And I know if you did the two parts, I know EMDR have changed their the length of time you had to get it if you did a virtual training versus when you did live trainings. So I think they EMDR have shortened it to like yet a year to get the consultation hours done. Um, but some training organizations may give you a longer time so that it would just depend. Um, so yeah. Cool. And it looks like, can we get an email for the 2024 hybrid training or can we sign up early? Yes. Yeah, it's already on the website, um, the website that I had linked there. Here, let me, if I can. Oops. And it says for DD clients with trauma, what IQ would EMDR be beneficial? Oh, that's kind of interesting. It's worked for kids as young as five, four. So you can do EMDR with anybody with any intellectual ability or not, or. Awesome. So they don't have to have a certain IQ or anything. Nope, not required. So I'm putting in the chat. Awesome. Um, the link to the EMDR professional training, basic training schedule. You're going to find our training on the right-hand side of the page, or maybe right-hand side of the page, but scroll down and you'll find, you'll see the one that says hybrid on it. It's the only one on the page that says hybrid on it. Um, and you can, you can look at that and get signed up. So, yeah. Awesome. If you want to email that to me really quick too, I will throw that into the email I yep. sent to everybody. I tried to copy it, but it doesn't, our chat settings because of our hospital. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. it, it's confusing. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. No, uh, and I will be sending the certificate out here this afternoon, probably in the next half an hour or so. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Again, thank you so much, Kelly. This was phenomenal. 
Awesome, yep. awesome, awesome. Um, we will have uh, our next one in August. I don't quite remember the topic because we talked about a few of them, but keep an eye out for those. Um, and hopefully Kelly will present for us again in the future because I really liked the way you present, so. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye.